side career in, in science writing. So I'm a research scientist, but also write science books on the side. And my previous book was called The Knowledge, How to Rebuild a World from Scratch, which was taking as a, as a premise, as, as, as the start of a thought experiment, uh, a hypothetical scenario of uh, there's been some kind of global catastrophe, some kind of apocalypse event, a doomsday event, the sort of thing we see in, in the cinema, but taking that as an assumption that it's happened, that you've lost the supportive network and infrastructure that we all just take for granted nowadays in our modern, industrialized, cozy lifestyles um, in the West and in the, in the developed world. And through the, the pages of the book, therefore explore the question, um, how much do any of us actually know about the basics of where things come from, the raw materials, the, the processes that they are put through to create the products that rely upon them, the things you pick up in a supermarket without a second thought on, on a Saturday afternoon. And how much of that could you do yourself if, if you ever had to? How could you go back to basics uh, and, and the first principles to make and do things from scratch for yourself? And how does that network of understanding and scientific knowledge give you new technologies and inventions which then themselves enable you to do more things and connect with each other. So th this is where the, the sort of things I talk about overlinks, overlaps very nicely with Marcin's work on the global uh, village constructor set, where I've been taking a more theoretical paper-based um, approach but for the mass market but for this book. And Marcin's been putting his money where his mouth is and actually making these sort of uh, self-sustaining infrastructure networks. Um, I don't know if any of the audience, and I, and I don't know where it is because I've not seen the link, but I delivered a 45 minute talk going into a lot of depth on those sort of broad brushstroke, brushstroke concepts, which I don't think is, is perhaps worth repeating now. Um, but perhaps if, if that goes up in the, in the chat box um, or something, you know, I don't know how that could be made available. But that is my background and my interest in, in this area of um, fabrication, back to basics, uh, fulfillment and the satisfaction you get from, from making and doing things yourself, and therefore how that links into appropriate technology, intermediate technologies, helping developing nations, and that area of real world applications of, of the sort of uh, knowledge base that we're talking about. Excellent, thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Anna Waldman-Brown. I I know some of you, um, Marcin, it's a pleasure to see you. I've been following Global Village Construction Set since back in the day, and but now I get to see you outside of a hacker camp. Um, I will be moderating this afternoon or evening. Um, first of all, are there any comments um, for Lewis? Lewis, how, how likely do you think your scenario situation is at this point? Um, irrelevantly likely for, for, the, the, for the point of the, of, the, of the thought experiment I was trying to run through. Um, I, I just wanted to have a scenario set up on page one where everything that we take for granted can no longer be taken for granted. So that people sat in their comfy seats at home, their sofas at home, or sat in a cafe reading a book um, have the rug pulled from beneath their, beneath their feet and start asking, thinking about themselves sort of questions that, you know, us community of people on this call right now spend a lot of their time thinking about, or indeed, <laughs> uh, many people around the world are in fact already experiencing as their day-to-day -day life. You know, it, it is that realization that us in, in the developed world have an exceedingly privileged and comfortable life but it is not something we should take for granted um, because many people don't live that lifestyle and indeed it's not beyond the, the boundaries of, of possibility that that lifestyle could be taken away from us in as i said some kind of hollywood style sudden apocalyptic event which we watch on, on tv screens or indeed what seems to be more likely to be a long slow grinding decline under the current climate or climate to, to excuse the pun of uh, global warming and um no, environmental degradation and all the, the issues we're very, very aware of. I, I, I don't pin, page one of, of the book of the knowledge doesn't pin itself to any particular catastrophic uh, event in particular. 
because that's unnecessary uh, as far as I saw it. I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right. Uh, so, Lewis, are you doing so the with a book written? Is any of your other research related to developing any of the, the, the things that you talk about as products, kind of like we do? Because I always talk about, okay, well, how do you get this out into the real life? Yeah. Sure. So, my actual research field is in astrobiology and the possibility of life on other planets which is it's a little bit different but but it's similar in the sense that it's very interdisciplinary and i've mm. in fact come from a biological background and i've learned a lot of uh, planetary science geology uh, physics sort of robotics along the way um, in my research career and have had conversations with people who work at places like ESA and nasa of applying the overlap between those two different uh, interests if you are trying to establish a self-sustaining colony on Mars, which is something that people like Elon Musk get very, very excited about, and, and indeed I, I, I think they have a pretty solid argument in the long term it's something that we would want to do as a species to you know, not keep our eggs in one basket and protect our long-term future, how would one go about that? How, how does one condense down to a seed, a kernel, all of the infrastructure and capability and machinery that you need to support community of humans, put it on the point end of a rocket, and then unpack it, unpack your suitcase when you arrive on Mars. And of course, the challenges for doing that on Mars are a great deal more difficult for doing it in an undeveloped region of the Earth where you can't even take basic raw materials on Mars for granted, such as air you can breathe or water you can scoop up in a cup and drink. So there are real world applications in that sense Although I also can see that that is still pretty blue skies and out there compared to much of the work that other people on this on this call do, um, such as Vinay, who I wanted to bring into the conversation because I'm a huge fan and I know he does a lot of work um, in this sort of area. Yes, Vinay. There we go. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know where do we go. Um, uh, so Vinay Gupta uh, got interested in open hardware when I accidentally designed this thing called the Hexayart, a very simple open source building. Uh, we've done a bunch of innovation on that platform over the past 20 years. Uh, and the, re the reason the project is still alive is because when I started it, I assumed it was going to take 30 years to get to global deployable capacity. So uh, planning over the horizon that way caused me to run the project as a hobby rather than assuming I was going to be able to raise uh, funding for it um, and uh, you know that th that framing uh, kind of gives me a particular kind of grim patience you know <laughs> the world is burning on pretty much the trajectory that I imagined 30 years ago the interest in doing something comprehensive about moving hundreds of millions of people is slowly beginning to build and unfortunately we were on the trajectory where my work might be relevant um, six years ago, I basically ran out of money doing disaster relief stuff and said, sod it, I'm going to go and get a real job, uh, joined the <laughs> Ethereum Foundation, uh, and spent six years since then in the blockchain space. Uh, one of the few people in the space to not get spectacularly rich because I took legal advice a little too early. Um, uh, so I am a working engineer, I run a company, we're VC funded, uh, and what we're doing is very high resolution legal structures for tracking physical goods. Uh, initially, things like fine art or wine, and then eventually Bruce Sterling's spine vision reified and you know made flesh. Um, so yeah, that. I mean, it will come in useful eventually. You know, when you start putting hundreds of millions of hex yards in the field, you want to be able to track individual units and figure out who paid for them. So the work will eventually come back together. You know, a technology base for managing physical assets in an extremely austere environment, that's a useful thing. We're going to get executional spec uh, execution specifications in there, executable specifications, so you can verify whether you've got the necessary raw materials and the necessary tools to manufacture an object. You know, we're working towards things which are useful again, but those things are still probably years out. Yeah, great points, everyone. Um, feel free to type questions in the chat or raise your hand. If you hit reactions, then you can click raise hand um, and I can call on you. Um, I'm 
curious while we're waiting for a quiet audience. Um, for Lewis, the I think one of the big differences between restarting civilization on Earth versus you know packing up a kit that makes almost anything and going to Mars is that even if knowledge is so scattered um, across our Byzantine um, supply chains network, we still will be starting from a lot of various broken pieces. So I'm curious what you think about the difference between sort of starting from scratch and starting from, um, let's say, like a, a broken apart infrastructure network, whether that's, um, you know, in an emerging market or in downtown New York. Sure. So, you know, there's, there's a series of related questions um, that have the, the same core at the heart. Uh, but differ in the exact parameters or sort of axioms of, of where you're starting from. Um, and as I said, for the, for the sake of what was a mass market popular science book, I went with what I thought would be quite zeitgeisty. And I, I don't mention the Z word, I don't mention the zombie word anywhere in, in the book, but, but it's kind of applied because that's the, the, the conceptual touchstone that I think most people um, can, can absorb and understand. Um, so I, I was dealing with that uh, project from from a cold start as it were but to address your question if we were to be trying to do this for real on Mars it, it of course isn't a cold start you're not trying to scrabble and scavenge for what you need and a devastated wasteland of, of some kind of post collapse environment you can do it with the infrastructure that we already have set up uh, in the world today but but as I said the, the similarity is still the same it's trying to think about what is the, the sort of the minimum viable product or the the, the minimum um, network that you need which is self-sustaining and self-sufficient that can be packed into a small space and then unfurl like a, like a lotus flower when, when you arrive um, and again again there's this there's, there's popular touchstone to this sort of thing in, in Martian and Andy Weir's excellent book uh, although it needed a bit of editing before it f f first came out uh, and then the, uh, the the film with, with Matt Damon, it, it, it's dealing with a, with a similar idea. There's, there are these, I think with, with a lot of, an important point perhaps to make with all of these projects is if you're trying to engage large numbers of people to think along these lines, it's to begin from a foundation of what they perhaps already appreciate and understand, which, which is why I go for these cultural references. Um, but yes, for, for starting Colony on Mars, you already have the established infrastructure here to enable you to do that and pack it up. But on the other hand, there are much more extreme environmental conditions that you need to be able to protect the humans from uh, and, and challenges to solve. Right, I, I loved the um, re the hacking of the abandoned Mars rovers in the Martian. There, there was a little bit of infrastructure there. <laughs> yeah, great points. Um, I see Leopold has joined us. Do you have a question? You're on video? Yeah. Uh, excuse me, it, it, maybe it's very interesting if we could have a round of uh, insights related to that important question that you put on the table. So um, let's let's try that, that in, in uh, starting by Joshua, then Marcin, and Binai, if you agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Joshua Pierce. I'm a professor at Western University in the other London in Canada, and I do work on solar photovoltaics and open source hardware. And so I've, um, I came to open hardware maybe a decade ago now at, at this point. I've been a little bit involved in open source software, but it really became apparent to me when I was working in my own lab just to do solar cell research that to build on the work of others there was really something behind kind of the open source movement applied to hardware. And and for me, really, it was the, the RepRap project that kind of opened my eyes. We've been working on a solar powered laptop for the developing world. And I'd finally, you know, finally, as a big professor, I got access to a rapid prototyper. I was so excited because it was the first time, you know, I used to keep a little invention notebook next to my uh, bed at night and try to invent something every night before I went to sleep. And I could finally make this stuff. But the thing they, they didn't tell you at the time was even though you had access to these tools, they cost a small fortune. And so that little you know, plastic cover that was going to snap onto the back of a laptop to make it solar powered cost almost as much as the laptop and more than the solar cells and all the electronics. And so this was never going to work. And so I was looking around for you know, how I could do rapid prototyping cheap so that you could even think about doing it in the developing world. 
and uh, actually a project from Britain, the RepRap project, had just been started. And I, I knew immediately <laughs> that this was going to be huge and that I was going to be part of it. And I think any engineer that hasn't seen the RepRap, you know, it's a 3D printer that prints its own components. If that doesn't make you salivate, I don't, well, you're probably not an actual engineer. And so um, my, my lab group kind of jumped into it full score and we started off just by making things as they broke. And so the light bulb really went off in my head that this was ready for showtime. Um, when I had a, a filter wheel changer break in my lab. And so a filter wheel changer just rotates and basically changes the color or the intensity of light that you're signing on a solar cell. And it's a very specialized component. So to get it fixed, it was 2,500 bucks. And that was pretty pricey for something so simple. Uh, but the bigger hit was that it was going to be weeks and weeks right at the beginning of the summer that I had to wait to get it ordered because the hardly anybody in the world uses these things. And so I hired a high school student to design one in OpenSCAD, ran it on the RepRap, and he did it in a couple of weeks. He did it faster than I could have purchased it. And the one that he designed was parametric. And so it not only solved my problem, it solved everybody's problem for the rest of time that has anything to do with filter wheel changing. And so it was, and it only cost 50 bucks. And so it, it cost far, far less. It was a superior technical device. And it was digitally made so that you could, you know, now that the files are shared and anybody that wants to make them for themselves, you need to know the basics of Arduino, which is an open source electronics platform, a little bit about 3D printing, and you can make it on yourself. And so that's when my lab kind of went all the way over. Like, we don't buy equipment anymore. We make it ourselves. We buy it from open source vendors so that we have total control of it. And that same principle that we're using to do kind of the high-end science goes all the way down to the poorest of the poor. You just need access to some of the basic tools, like solar photovoltaic panels to convert sunlight into electricity, which is available pretty much everywhere and now at a low enough cost that it's starting to become accessible to at least the poor in the west but soon the poor everywhere and digital replication technology so RepRap was the first but now we've got lots and lots of tools whether it's pcb mills or laser cutters that allow or basically anything marson does <laughs> that, that allow you to make the things for civilization and i i think getting to kind of lewis's dream of you know having the the information that you need to recreate civilization, whether it's you know right here on Earth in a kind of underdeveloped area, or after catastrophe or on Mars, that's within our power now, and that is coming on fast. When I started in this, I was actually very worried that my first kind of professor job, where I'd switched over to open open source stuff, I was very concerned it was going to destroy my career, and so I, I kind of you know. I'm very conservative, so I, I did two things. I did the open source stuff, and I kept the solar stuff going just so I made sure it was always employable. Uh, but as it turned out, my most recent job is to do open source stuff. I got a raise. I got a really nice position. I'm chaired to do open hardware. And, and if there's anyone on here that has any interest in getting a PhD in open hardware, um, I'm hiring. So, like, this is real now. This is not make-believe. You can get you can run your whole life this way if you want to. Um, it, because it's a superior way to develop technology. I can say, you know, it's, I've had very, very smart students in my lab. We've made some amazing things. But the truth is, the reason that we're productive and the reason that we write so many papers and get the technology rolling so fast is help from outside. We get help from all over the place. People I've never met that comment on the wiki stuff that we do on Apopedia to people that write, you know, you, you know code that we then incorporate in our own devices. I mean, this is... It truly is superior. Software has known it for a long time, and, and hardware, I think, is, is catching up. Fantastic. I haven't heard from Marcin. Fantastic. It's all converging. So let's. Oh, am I? Uh, is my mic on? Yep, is we on. can hear you. Let's talk about so. So, the, the other thing that's happening right now also is the rock bottom price of PV panels. Let's talk about that, mm. because that brings about some new, new opportunities. When we started this, I started this about a decade ago. In fact, in 2004 was when open source ecology was first formulated in my last year of the PhD, where unlike Joshua, I, I tried to make myself unemployable because this world was not for me. So I moved out to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but at that time, you can talk about like, what was the cost of solar cells at that time? Maybe like, I don't know, four bucks, uh, whatever it was. But right now it's like 10x. Mm. I mean, just think about what that makes possible. So 
for a long time I thought about okay hydrogen too you know hydrogen you know solar is there just like wrap wrap 3d printing is there nobody knows about it I mean the technology diffuses uh, so only so fast throughout the rest of civilization there's first adopters like for us Joshua others you know 3d printing is natural for many people it's like what that exists even so technology doesn't spread as fast as you'd like uh, but with the solar revolution wow uh, very few people know that uh, it's extremely feasible right now you can go off grid right now like this house here the cost of the system that we're doing is actually one tenth of what I could pay on a grid it's 1.2 cents per kilowatt hour right now okay and take that further um, going back to the dream so when I studied um, energy I studied fusion and then I got back back into solar energy because I th thought fusion was too complicated so I talk a lot about uh, I wanted to get into appropriate technology but right now so at that time hydrogen was was like okay cool uh, but electricity to do electrolysis if you get it from water so that's green hydrogen uh, very simple there's plenty of water absolute abundance you can have dirty hydrogen from fossil fuels too uh, that's not what we're talking about but right now with solar panels uh, if the cost is what it like if you can do a system that's about one cent per kilowatt hour you won't read a lot about that in the mainstream media let's say the price may be a little higher than that number maybe some industrial systems large-scale systems can attain like a one cent I mean Joshua you might what is the official cost of PV on an industrial scale? Like, how much can you produce a kilowatt hour for? So in, in India, you can get down to a few pennies now. Uh, in the U.S., it's it's a little bit more than that, maybe six or seven. Yeah. And coming coming down, but the you're right. The, the point is, it's now the lowest cost form of electricity, and the smaller systems for residential are higher than that. Like the system on my house is maybe fifteen cents per kilowatt hour, but. I have to pay 20 cents so I'm still making money the the trick though is to do it yourself just like everything else that we're talking about if you start to manufacture say the racking for yourself that's the most expensive component at this point and like the BIPV work that that you do Marcin it's like <laughs> BIPV costs much more unless you do it yourself and then it costs less right right and that's exactly what we're doing so we're com combining a bit of open source design do it yourself building integrated but we're at for real 1.2 cents so if that is real and we can do that and we can scale that through open source by teaching others and disseminating that 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 for example makes hydrogen uh feasible if you look at okay here's a cost of uh x cents per kilowatt hour for electricity well we actually are getting down to this i went through the numbers we're getting to like 80 cents or so gasoline gallon equivalent if we can replicate the kinds of costs that we're getting right now so that's pretty amazing and just to say where we're at right now so right now we're actually getting into building housing low-cost housing the cd home project you might have seen that all open source design but our next hit I'd just like to introduce that here as one place uh, this not this year or next year but perhaps the year after after we do a little bit of the housework as a replicable revenue model we're getting into the the hydrogen but but simply you can even burn it in internal combustion en engines no no, no uh, fuel cells required keep that low tech appropriate and mm -hmm. uh, cause a revolution like that but only if you were if you yeah it's hard to like if, if i say this to somebody they kind of might, ro might roll their eyes it is a I, I do believe it's a real possibility here on earth and anywhere else uh, to get that kind of low cost uh, and i think that that is where the open source distributed development distributed energy systems come into place and of course the current system is not going to really promote solving that question because there's a lot of in industrial inertia that's where I think the open source collaborative development really has a, a part uh, to continue developing the electrolyzers, storage systems, and all, all those things like the myths around hydrogen that uh, it might explode and things like that. Those things like about storage and safety, that's, that's all been resolved. That's been resolved for decades. Right now the price was the only thing that's killing, killing it. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm excited these days and that would definitely be a thing where okay now you can have truly distributed autonomous energy even though PV is feasible right now a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that oh well you can't store it for the night well 
one side is efficiency you can if you have a very smart system doing that but on the other hand if you want to run life like like it is today and you don't even see a difference and some storage would come in but that's that's just a thought that comes in um, well, I, I think i think you're right and i think the storage is slightly behind the pv technology but for small systems and that's something that i think you know when we look at you developing a solar system in the west we're thinking about you know a house with a dishwasher and that kind of thing and i I lived in Finland for a year and nobody has dishwashers there. So like it, it's it's all very specific to your location. And if you're just looking to solar power, you know, your lights or your computer or your cell phone, that's very doable. And building those systems is approachable to, by everybody. Uh, Lonnie Grafman, who was the founder of Apropedia and I, are just putting together a free book on the subject, kind of mm-hmm. collecting all the things that Apropedians have developed over the last, you know, decade or more. And some of the stuff my lab has put together. And it's... This is these are systems that everybody can build, and certainly, kind of within the, the Fab Lab community, this is, is baby stuff. Like you guys can do this. Everybody on this call, I'm sure, can, can build a solar system in an afternoon with batteries. <laughs> Hydrogen will be slightly long, maybe two days. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to invite our guests to raise his hands and uh, uh, ask something to to our panelists. How do I get a PhD in open source hardware? Is that real? <laughs> that's that's totally real. So the, the I, I've actually have several students that have gone through where their thesis topic is something like development of open source blankety blank. Um, so it's it's really just a matter of finding oh, a project and the advisor okay, and getting funding to match up. Um, so so right now at at Western I've got two big lines. One is open source solar photovoltaic development. And so we're going to be doing a lot of racking, a lot of systems design over the next little bit. And then the other one is DRAM, which is stands for distributed recycling and additive manufacturing. But the idea is you take uh, plastic trash in your neighborhood or from your own house, grind it up, turn it into feedstock that you then can put into a 3D printer. And that 3D printing, whatever you're 3D printing then, whether it's products for sale or things that you need for your own home, the technologies to do all that, like, there's definitely chains to do that. And many people have, have proven that it's physically possible. What the challenge is and what we're working on now is to make it easy enough that you don't need a PhD to, to make it happen. And so the probably the area that I'm most excited about doing now is coupling computer vision and AI to 3D printing systems so that they fix themselves um, during the print. Because anyone that's used one of these knows that it's, it's not perfect just yet. So less spaghetti. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Lewis, did you have a question? I had a, a quick question. What what sort of sources of funding uh, are you able to get for the PhD students for, for open source uh, projects? Is that a thought quite hard to come by? It's I, I thought it I thought it was, but it's it's just not. So the for example, my largest source of funding now is a multi million dollar DARPA project, and you think DARPA would be like top secret. Mm. That's not how they are at all. Yeah. They are, they they want results, period. And they don't care how you do it. And that the, when we put in the application and the open source hardware was written all over the place. And the, that particular project is a plastic recycling project too, but it's, it's further out there. So their goal is to make waste plastic in the field. Like you're in the back of a Humvee, you throw it into a black box and out comes protein powder. And that sounds insane but we actually have proven every step along the way it's it's me two chemical engineers and two biologists and the the biologists mm-hmm. have things that they pulled out of the lake that can eat plastic and we maybe will be able to eat them we haven't proven that it's not toxic protein yet <laughs> but it is it's protein and um and then all the all the tools to take the plastic and break it down um we're making open source hardware so we're using open source bioreactors hydrocyclones to, to get the water out, like the whole thing, the, the drying unit is a open source vacuum dryer that we've already published. So like every, in the end, anyone that wants to create a company off of this or to you know do it for a completely non-military type application is more than welcome. Um, they just wanted a, a solution in the field so that they could get something useful out of basically MRE packets that you know are, they don't want to load or they don't want to carry them around so they can they turn them into something useful. 
And so that funding is funding multiple PhDs to try to make this happen. And that that is um, that's pretty mainstream. Like it's not not even radical. So it, it, there's DOE funding, NSF funding, at least in the U.S. Um, in, in Canada, I'll be mostly looking at NSERC and then uh, foundations and that kind of thing. Yes, Leopold. Uh, where, where can I find this uh, this documentation? Because I think that's one of the big problems uh, in open source hardware that uh, a lot of interesting projects, but it's uh, very hard to find them because we are missing a, a, a good repository. But, but maybe I should make a short introduction of myself. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm born in Vienna, I'm sitting in Vienna, uh, but I bought some land on the countryside and I want to move there in the next years. And uh, currently we are doing some things on the countryside which are not easy possible in the city because we, we have uh, much more space. But in, in general, uh, uh, I, I thought a lot about it and uh, I, I'm sure that I want to make a shift from the, the classical Fab Lab uh, because I, uh, I find it boring to, to print some funny plastic stuff with a 3D printer. Uh, I'm more interested in printing with clay and I'm interested in biomaterials and I'm interested in the in the wood white web and in nature and sustainability so uh, uh, I, I think we we need uh, something which uh, they call in Germany open echo labs uh, with, with, uh, with, with a shift in 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 on, on, on the focus what what the fed labs are doing and uh, i would like to mention uh, uh, we we have some uh, interesting flagship projects in austria like one project it's the vivi house it's an an, an architecture project and uh, we, we have a project with a centennial washing machine and i think it's very important to to, to mention that uh, almost everybody associates uh, electronics with, with open source hardware and uh, open source hardware is much more than electronics. Thank you, Leopold. Yeah, great points. Um, we have a question here from John, who um, Pleasure to have you here. Who has one of the um, almost certainly one of the world's largest distributed manufacturing networks, um, Enable of prosthetic hands. So um, he's wanting details about um, why it might be toxic and how presumably that chemical engineering works. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually I just submitted the paper on it, and I'd be happy to send anybody a pre um, preview. Um, so we're using HPLC mass spec work to try to, but the problem is, is you have an un, you have a, a bunch of different microbes, like a whole consortium, hundreds probably, and we have no idea what they are and which ones were responsible for which plastic. We also don't know what plastic's going in and what contaminants there are. So you have a, just a big mess and then you're having a bigger mess, eat it, and then you're getting something out on the other side. So you have no idea what that is. And so the, the only way to do this like the old-fashioned way would be you would do a bunch of lab rat studies with each chemical that you found in it and each one of those lab rat studies cost a million dollars and the, you know the, to give you a feel for this I did it on leaf extract from red maple leaves which is the most common maple leaf in, or most common leaf in a tree in North America and there were something like 47,000 chemicals in it so you can see how this gets absurdly ridiculously expensive very fast and so what I'm what we attempted to do is to use a op completely open source software tool chain to identify all of the chemicals in this goo and then compare it to the European Open Toxic Database. And from that, then we get a, a number of things. And then those, we need to run back through the system to identify exactly what they are. And then we'll back 
trace and see if we can figure out if that's something we can either eliminate from the food source coming in, or maybe we need to, you know, cut out a couple of microbes. So this is really, we're just, DARPA is all about next, next. So we're just starting. Uh, but the basics of the toxic analysis I've already published about the leaf, and you can use that same protocol to do uh, anything, basically, any kind of non-targeted toxic screening. Um, but it is a, it's scary. <laughs> I don't want to kill anyone. Can I ask a dumb question here? Um, is there any concern that these microbes will uh, figure out how to like infect everybody's electronics and eat the plastic that runs civilization? Or do they need specialized environments to survive in? The, that's a, actually a great question, because I had something yeah. similar. So this the, is the ring world problem, right? The, the ring world the books, you know, like they wind up with a, a mold that eats their superconductors. And their civilization implodes. This is Lewis's collapse scenario. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the Andromeda so, strain as well, yeah. it's, it's the Michael Crichton Andromeda strain, but it started uh -huh. eating oh, it, of rubber. Do, does it eat? Oh, it eats rubber. Okay. We, we, well, we haven't tested rubber yet. We're, we're just focusing mostly on the most common, like polypropylene, ET, HDP, uh, those types of plastics. Um, and and the, the microbes that we're working with right now are all natural. We do have a, a, I don't know, a professional biohacker on the team. And he's trying to get it so that we can produce preferentially different types of things like more fat or higher protein percentages. And those microbes, have, like they're already chosen because they eat, say, a breakdown product of one of the plastics. And then they're, he's trying to like amp up their ability to produce what we're aiming at. Mm -hmm. Those ones, I was like, well, what happens if they start out competing everything and destroy all the natural bacteria? But um, the bio people on the project assure me that they're the weak they're the weak ones and they will be destroyed in the natural environment long yeah. before Le lavender's law right lavender's law wild type always wins right yeah, yeah but it, it is this is um it, to me it, it's all sci-fi anyway right it's my, i'm much more of a hard scientist the gooey stuff makes me uncomfortable i will be honest you know? you oh, have a question uh, can I comment on this? So let's talk about colla the collaboration part, open source and collaborative. So any of these problems here could be solved readily, like overnight or in a week or a year, if enough energy, focused energy came about to do it. So what are the what are your observations maybe in the house, since we've got some open hardware heavy hitters here, what are your observations on the limits to collaboration? Because in our work over the last decade, we simply say it's the collaborative literacy part the fact that people do not understand what collaboration truly is, I mean, based on the proprietary world we live in. But how do we have some ideas of how to start breaking down those barriers? It's encouraging that you're at a university, maybe we can start pumping students through collaborations, like recently actually with the GI Bill. Uh, that's a possibility, I'd like to definitely talk to you, follow up on, on that, because we're connect getting connected to that. But imagine we feed a bunch of GI Bills uh, funded open hardware hackers into the program. But let's talk about collaboration. Any comments on that? What are the limits and how do we break them down? So it, it's unexpectedly hard. You know, um, the, uh, so we've got, I mean, Hexier Project probably has at this point yeah, 10,000 people that are capable of building a Hexier. Maybe it's 5,000. Uh, they're building a few, you know, a few tens of thousands, five, 10,000 units a year. Uh, six commercial enterprises building them at this point. Um, but there's really, really minimal collaboration. There's not much innovation. Uh, people have figured out the design works, and then at that point, they're very reluctant to touch it. Um, so there's a real, it was a very, it was a huge surprise to me that you could wind up with scale, but without innovation. Um, most of the innovation is still driven by me kind of getting people to do stuff for me, like, hey, I think this would be cool if it did this. Could you take a crack at that? Oh, yeah, sure, I could do that. And, you know, like, I basically have to nudge people to get most of that kind of stuff moving. And that's really surprising. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising in that you see the same thing with Wikipedia and you see the same thing with Linux. Enormous numbers of users, very few contributors. So in a sense, that's a sign of success. Um, but I think that we have a sort of notion of, like, you know, if you've got 50 users, you sort of think you might have half a dozen contributors. And it's actually more like if you've got 50,000 users, you might have 200 contributors. I, I, th I 
think you're right. And I, Marcin, I think you hit on the, this is the, the biggest challenge. And it possibly it goes back to what Leopold was saying, is that we don't have a good open hardware centralized database. Like I, I use Apropedia all the time. I find it really good, but I like, and I know Vinny's used it a little bit as well. But no, the, all the Hexera stuff lives there. There is no other Hexera resource. Okay, and and that so that has the potential to be it. But I know, like from you know working with hundreds of students over the years, if if, if they're forced to use a wiki in a class, they will do it for the grade. But then the number that stay on and continue to contribute is depressingly small. And I being in it it's very hard to see why everyone doesn't do this type of work it's fun it's exciting you're trying to help people you're helping yourself like why would you work on it but the the fact is it's still immensely challenging to have people have the willingness to open something up and you know kind of within the fab lab community and the open hardware community as a whole you've got these you know they're willing to take apart their toaster and fix it but the vast majority of people aren't comfortable doing that um, and and that's where I think education really needs to, to get there. I mean, where everybody feels comfortable doing everything. And right now it's it's really pretty sad. And it even within the university, even within engineering, it's very common to have like a, a mechanical engineer not know how basic electricity works or an electrical engineer like not understand how like gears work. Um, so it's we're, we're all used to being pigeon tailed and becoming these super experts, but there's something to be said for having a little bit of knowledge in everything so that you can play. Well, John has a good point, sorry. Well, it's not a point, I, I, I want to point out that I think there's a really important insight in what you two have just commented on. And I think we should recognize that for, that for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a relatively small number of oddballs like present company who thrive on this sort of innovative creative, let's try something and make it up, and we're going to be a minority, and actually we, sh we will waste our time if we try to convert the masses into the oddball state. So there, are two, so there are two opportunities in that. One is, we don't do such a good job of collaborating with each other either, right? We don't have to blame the other guys who don't use um, Wikipedia. We're all working on our own silos, and that's something that we ought to address. And secondly, um, we've just recognized that there's a world of people out there who could pick up and scale up our solutions if we made them available. And we should figure out how to repackage what we, we have done that appeals to us in such a way that it is packaged not to make us feel good, but to make them feel, hey, I can do this, what the hell? Okay, so mm -hmm. what is the any solutions, John? Since you've thought about the question, um, well, yeah. I, to the second one, I do think that um, writing documentation intended not for the person who's writing it, but for the people who need to read it, is a classic problem. Mm. And it's a very hard one to get around, but it's not rocket science. Um, but you know, those of us who are so busy trying to do cool stuff often write the record in order to satisfy ourselves, not to satisfy the people who could adopt it. That, I think, is a relatively well understood problem. The nonier problem of how this sort of creative open source brain trust can collaborate in a more focused way in order to sort of put the point of the sphere where it needs to be which I think has to do with the survival of civilization and the planet, uh, I don't yet have a good answer to. But I think we really ought to be focusing on it because there's a lot at stake. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me, I was watching some machine learning uh, scientists talking the other day about how um, one of the big problems with making AI explainable is that the engineers who are trying to make this AI tell them what they're, what it's actually doing um, are the least equipped to know like what the average person wants to know from this AI. And so if you're talking about like a, a robot that's making quality control decisions in a factory, right? It's not, that robot shouldn't be talking to the engineers who are designing the robot. That robot should be talking to the lay people who are trying to use it. 
Um, and so I think that that problem gets extremely magnified when like you have no incentives whatsoever for documentation. Um, and then these engineers are trying to figure out like how to communicate. I'm curious, and I see Isaac has joined us, he's been working on this as well. Um, are what good examples have you all seen in terms of incentivizing collaboration or um, really sparking that like one to two percent of uh, innovators to engage with the network? What makes you think it's as high as one or two percent? Wikipedia numbers are about one to two percent are active okay. contributors. So that's not even like the people who do most of the pages. Yeah, I would yeah. guess it's more like 0.1 percent or the people who do everything. I was going to say, because I mean, that, that fixing a typo here and there might be one or two percent. Yeah. But writing a page from scratch, can anybody find stats? I don't the, know. The other thing is Wikipedia has definitely changed. So like maybe 10 or 20 years ago, back when it was started, it was, I would say, a nurturing community, sort of like Appropedia is now, where you're, people are there to help you and to build it. And nowadays, you know, the Wikipedia has actually shrunk, and it's shrunk because the, the few kind of super users are just slashing and burning everything. There was, mm -hmm. there was a battle over RepRap a couple years ago where they killed the page, and it's like, what are you guys doing? Like, this, <laughs> this is exactly what Wikipedia was built to, to put up, and it took um, months for the, the fighting to finally stop. And so I, I think part of that is, you know, everybody wants to be you know, the king of their little tiny kingdom. Um, we have to find a way to have collaboration in a way that keeps everything there so that we're always able to build upon on each other. And I, you know, in software, they've got the Git system that works fairly well, but normal people are not going to be able to use that unless it gets substantially easier. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, I, and, I basically would run my company on Git, not for software, but for um, documentation for physical assets. And uh, teaching, you know, museum curator types to use Git in the workplace. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> that so it, it, it's a. I think we still need to crack. I think that is a is a, something we could put some substantial brain power in as to how to do proper, especially for open hardware. Uh, you know, based building upon each other's work. Like, um, you know, John, you'd asked about like creating filament from from waste plastic and that is still pretty hard like it's hard to get a recycle bot that functions well and to date my paper with the most figures in it is the recycle bot paper it had more than 100 freaking figures on how to build one and it's still not good enough frankly like I st we still get emails all the time so it's like it it needs to be done better it needs to be made easier um, and that goes for basically everything so there's still tons of engineering that needs to go into making kind of a truly distributed fabricatable um, civilization, because that's just one stink device. There's at least 50 that we need to, to get civilization going. If only somebody <laughs> had a map of those systems. <laughs> I can't remember hearing something about a project that did that. Um, so, what I'm I'm about to drop uh, two open hardware projects um, that we're basically doing the commercial infrastructure for. Um, so the first is a plywood violin project um, uh, run by um, a fellow by the name of Robert Brewer Young, who is a violin maker, uh, a luthier. So he's been trying to figure out how to get it um, such that you can do CNC cutting of off-cut wood from people that are selling to the professional violin makers. And you take the off-cuts, you cut them in CNC machines, uh, and then a high school wood shop has the rest of the tooling that you would need to put these things together. Because uh, it turns out at the end of the day that violins are more or less the kind of things that you can make with pretty much a knife and infinite patience, which is pretty much the tooling that they had back in the day, right? You start with a log and you remove everything which isn't the violin and then you glue the remaining pieces together. Um, so there's that and there's also a thousand year clock project. And the thousand year clock is about four feet across. It's a spectacular looking object made by an artist in New Zealand. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to package all of these things up using the same structure that we're currently using for doing provenance of gold bars. So we've got a legal structure where you can take multiple source of tr sources of truth about an object, each one of which is contributing different information. So 
this guy says the gold bar is really in the vault. You know, this guy over here says that the gold bar has the following number. This guy over here says that uh, the gold bar will be released under the following legal conditions. And each one of these things is bound to a legal warranty. So if that fact turns out not to be true in a way that damages the owner of the object, um, they get paid. And we're gradually integrating this into the DeFi ecosystem. So, you know, six months from now, we'll have all singing, all dancing insurance products that back this stuff up rather than individuals having liability. And what we're planning on doing is basically loading up all the plans from which an object was manufactured. So we do a certification from the author of the plans. This is the set of plans that I put in. Then we have an authorization from somebody who has manufactured it that says I manufactured it to that spec. And then we have one, two, three independent verifiers that compare the object at the end of the process to the specification and vouch for it. Um, and in the context of the distributed manufacturing, the kind of idea is that you would um, manufacture a violin, then you would get the violin inspected by in multiple independent third parties, then a foundation would buy the violin, which is how you would get paid, and then they would lease the violin to young musicians that wanted to play the violin. So you might buy the violin for $100, and then you might lease it for $3 a year or something like that. And that allows you to impose maintenance conditions as part of the lease so the violins will be taken care of and so that we don't accidentally you know, wind up with them just wandering off and this kind of stuff. Um, so that as an approach, you know, we could take any substantial chunk of open hardware and we could do that with it. Um, and that begins to create the legal frameworks because Preventing people from manufacturing things is basically not the point, right? We don't want to prevent people from manufacturing things. That is not the name of the game. But doing the quality assurance to verify that something is up to the standard of the original planning, that is a service. And people could charge money for doing that service as a way of making money from their innovations. Might be, for example, a business model for OSE. The designs are free. But if you want us to stamp this thing as you actually manufactured it to spec, we inspect and you pay us to inspect and then we put a digital signature on. Um, so although I've been kind of inactive on the Hexier front because, you know, like, it just wasn't clear what the next move was, but we were very stuck on that. Uh, other than the little homeless encampment we did in LA, which is another story. But the um, what I have been doing is I've been working towards building the legal infrastructure so that we could build a blockchain-based market for open hardware using these new business models and authentication techniques as a way of validating the hardware is up to specification, but also getting the original designers of the plan uh, paid. So, you know, watch this space this year. Um, Do you see an application to, for example, say we're building a block in Kansas City, I don't know, any applications mm -hmm. that you can see, say we're, we are making open source housing. How do we apply it today? Maybe some value provided to the city that needs some v validation on Oh, this got certain qualities. So, I mean, if you, <laughs> how how hard do you want to lean on this? Because there are things we can do. So, oh, supposedly, supposedly you take a set of plans and then you sell the housing off the set of plans, right? Yeah. We guarantee that in eighteen months there will be twelve houses for sale to the following specification on the following patch of land. You buy this commercial right to live in that house from us. But you open it up for a secondary market. So somebody buys that right before you've broken the ground and they're taking a big risk so they get a pretty low price. Over the course of the project, it becomes more and more certain that that house will get built. And they can then sell those tokens on to the people that actually expect to buy those houses and live in. And what you're doing here is you're using speculators as a way of financing the property development. Now, that as an approach, Right, you then have to provide some kind of meaningful guarantee that the house is received will be the same as the house is promised. And to bridge that gap, you have a set of people that essentially come in as guarantors for a different part of the work. I'm doing the roof, I guarantee the roof will be up to spec. I'm doing the windows, I guarantee the windows will be up to spec. Each one of the crafts people involved in the production of the house puts out an independent, limited, uh, an independent warranty on the work that they're doing. And the crux of this is that they get paid not just for doing the work, but when the house changes hands, they get a residual fee if the work that they've done is still in functional condition. So 
it incentivizes people not only to do the job right the first time, but to make sure the stuff is durable because they're getting a fee every time the house changes hands from the new owner, not to buy the piping or the roof, but to buy the guarantee that the piping and the roof will still be there in 25 years. We're, we're basically trying to build the structural economics of an open source permafacture. Have any of you written this up? Anywhere? Uh, we, we have a product. We're selling it right now. Okay. Uh, send us so things. Send us things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this, is, <laughs> this is what the company does. We went out the gold bars are basically, you know, what we're attempting. Gold bars and fine art are what we're going to do to pay the bills. Um, but the open source stuff is kind of still very much part of the picture. Um, let me see if I can find an asset pass. Renee, if we are training the people to build, because part of the issue is that there may be some very high high price trades that do things in a complicated way. We're simplifying things. Mm -hmm. How would you see that working in this model? That was simply the, the guarantors are the people we train? Well, you've got a guarantee that the stuff works, right? Yes. And all the way through this, somebody has to figure out who's picking up the slack. Right, you know, if something is going to get screwed up, somebody's going to have to pay, and the question is who is going to have to pay. So, is it the person that did the work? Is it the buyer of the house? Is it some third party guarantor? Is it society? Um, so, uh, I just pasted it in the chat. There is an NFT for a physical object. Yeah, feel free to share your screen. It's a uh, uh, yeah, I can, I can enable. See uh, hang on, I'm just gonna let me paste another link into the chat just so we got everything in one place. So if people want to follow along, they can. Uh, no, that did not work. Okay, give me a second. Let me actually paste the link here. Um, For something like a house, would this complicate? I know economists love to talk about the net present value decreases over time. And mm -hmm. so you could actually incentivize mm -hmm. um, that the value of some object to stick around. So does, does this intersect with like the right to repair laws um, in terms oh. of making things more repairable or? Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you can see the figure. So th this is a thing on a website called OpenSea. OpenSea is basically eBay for NFTs. So 99% of what's for sale on OpenSea is a uh, digital art which is being sold for cryptocurrency um we then loaded into that physical objects using a bunch of esoteric legal hackery and the physical objects include things like gold bars fine art you know i think the most expensive thing we've sold so far is about eight thousand dollars but we've only been operational for about a month um if anybody knows friends who run like sneaker companies and want to sell like high-end sneakers as nfts come and give us a share so you document the object, you stick the object in a vault, you sell the NFT of the object, right? And that's the most primitive and most controlled form of this technology. Once you get the objects out of the vault and they're protected by legal structures rather than by physical walls, you're basically kind of moving towards Bruce Serling's spine vision. Um, so here's the, um, so you've seen the open sea side of it. This is the on asset passport, and this is the legal identity of the object which is being sold using this OpenSea NFT. So the NFT is basically like a transferable deed that people can buy and sell that gives them the right to take the object out of the vault. And then what this is, this is the legal information that defines what the object is that they're buying sight unseen. Does that make sense so far? Because this is a pretty crazy story. It is a crazy story. Can you emphasize again objects protected by law not walls what what was that so right now all the things that we're buying and selling they're only for sale while they're sitting inside of a, ba uh, a vault so a physical object is put into a vault then the right to take the physical object out of the vault is being bought and sold as an nft right that's phase one in phase two we take the object out we put the object into a trust and then the trust leases you the object, right? Then you do what you like with the object, and when the time comes to get rid of the object again, you find a new person, you instruct the trust that they're the new custodian of the object, and then you do a financial transaction and hand them the goods. They then certify that the goods are in the correct condition, 
if they are, they accept them and they pay you. If they reject the goods at that point, then at that point you're stuck with them. You have to fix them before you can sell them. So this also has implications for things like free property. Um, why why don't you just start with the trust? Why why the why the vault and the NFT to begin? Um, you phone somebody up and ask for a vault, and they give you a vault, and it costs you three hundred dollars a month. You phone somebody up and ask for a trust, and you wind up talking to lawyers for six months. Trust structures are super slippery, um, and there's enough value in vaults to keep us busy for a while. So gold, whiskey, art storage, and places like the Geneva Freeport. You know, there, there's enough stuff to be doing in that that we hope to build a profitable business doing that, and then we can extend out into the more complex cases as we go. Um, so let me show you the kind of payload of this. Um, so we have a set of reference images of the object, and if we were dealing with open hardware, these things would be schematics of the object as it ought to exist, and maybe pictures of what it would look like if you built it properly. Or they would be pictures of the actual object that had been manufactured. And you could put your know, DXFs or whatever else you had in here. Um, then you get to this little doohickey, which is the legal contract. So the legal contract is basically 14 pages of legalese that says, if the description that I gave you was wrong, I will pay you the following amount of money. And every time the asset changes hands and it's bought by one person, the person who buys it pays a residual fee to each one of the people that offered these guarantees um, so that they are covered by the same guarantees as the original purchaser. So this provides this residual income stream to the people who provided the original information about the object. And this is potentially how we get people paid for designing open hardware. But doesn't the uh, open hardware designers then take on like a continuous liability? Like that would scare the tar out of me. Well, the continuous liability is, and this is this is a delicate thing, right? So if the liability you're taking on is that I designed this, these are the plans, I've built it and it worked, right? If you build it correctly, you've got the same results I did and here's the lab performance data. Um, how much do you want to get paid for making the guarantee that your plan works? Right? The plan is free to anybody that wants it for free. If you want to pay for a little bit of cover in case it's a fiasco, you pay a little money. If you want to pay a lot of money in case it's a fiasco, you pay a lot of money. So, so really, it's it's about monetizing your ability to subsume risk. So, like if we use like a, an eco home as an example, mm -hmm. I, I'm fairly confident Martian's plans are solid, but in my I would be very concerned, say someone messes up the plumbing and then you know, you don't notice it for a little bit, person goes on vacation, house is flooded, millions of dollars of I don't know, art is destroyed, uh -huh. and then you're on, on the hook for it. So you're on the hook for the amount of price that you want to absorb. So if I say, right, I guarantee that if you follow these instructions correctly, you're gonna get a working wrap wrap. Right? You do the design, Bob does the construction, Harry buys the printer. Right? So you sell a license that says, if you follow the instructions correctly, then you will get a working printer, it will have the following attributes. And if it doesn't, if there's a design flaw, I will accept liability for that. But my liability is limited to the cost of building the printer, which is $400. And I'm going to charge you 50 bucks for that warranty. So that structure where you're charging people for the promise that the goods will work if they're correctly implemented, this then goes down to Bob. Bob then certifies that he's manufactured at your specification. And then you, perhaps optionally, bless Bob's implementation. And then you charge another $25 for that. Or a third party QA team comes in, verifies that this thing has been correctly built, and they sell the warranty. Mm -hmm. So, what we're doing here is we're separating out, I gave the boy the plans for free. If you want insurance that the plans are correct, you buy the insurance. And if you're doing something like sending these down things to Mars and the cost of failure is gigantic, maybe you should be talking to Lloyds of London about underwriting them. So it provides a way of tiering the risk. If it's low risk, I don't buy the insurance. If it's medium risk, I buy the warranties. If it's high risk, I buy special warranties from specialized providers.
And what this provides us as a way of doing is risk compensating any kind of open source hardware project um, because it allows multiple parties to come in and certify. So if you've got a set of plans for an open source car and you've got a sign off from, oh, I don't know, one of the big insurers, AXA, that says, look, we've had 12 university teams review the plans and we're confident this thing is roadworthy. You can drive it in the following six countries and we'll sell a guarantee of that. Every time you buy one of these cars, you're going to buy that guarantee from AXA. So you, in the event that you get sued because somebody says your car isn't proper, AXA picks up the tab, not you. And this is basically providing, uh, you know, a lot of the reason the corporations exist in the hardware domain is to soak up the risk of what happens when things go wrong with the hardware that they're selling. So finding ways of soaking up the risk without creating a whole new set of opportunities for you know corporations to do their thing is sort of the gold state here. Because I'm pretty sure that the risk absorbing function is necessary. I think we need entities to be able to soak the risk of things like you know badly manufactured hardware or poor design. Um, but what we don't want is to have those corporations be uh, broad in their scope of operations. Insurers, although they are you know, evil corporate bastards at heart, um, they're still evil corporate bastards that work for you because they sell insurance to you and they have a very, very limited, tight, narrow scope of operations. And if you think of things like underwriters laboratories, you know, they've been ensuring the quality of domestic appliances for, I don't know, 60 years or something. Um, they really do excellent work on making sure that the stuff that you buy in the stores is safe. And so I think that we've, if we figure out how to get the right interface between the open hardware community and the insurance community, um, we wind up in a position where open hardware becomes much more directly competitive with uh, the stuff provided by corporations. I've been busy. For sure. Okay, we are at uh, 6.15 and we are approaching the end. So, uh, I think that it's very, very important that this dream team that you, that we have the pleasure to have now, today, in this uh, uh, 516 event, could continue to interact, could continue to deploy some collaboration, like, like Marcy says. And uh, for that matter, we're going to enable uh, a, a, a new sort of hypertext a idea uh, and project on our website, greenfablabnetwork.com, uh, using, uh, with your permission, the, your videos and the, um, some texts that enable to uh, find out the best approach to resilience. Um, Binai show us a very interesting feature that is the other AI, how is name it, Minai? Hmm? Other AI? Oh, Otter, yeah, yeah. Uh, I tried to get rid of that thing at the beginning of the call and it's basically stalking me, so that will prepare a transcript of the call. Uh -huh. uh, and I can send that over later on. Uh, I yeah. just set it up today and it joins all my calls automatically and if I'm the host, I can kick it. Uh, but if I'm not the host, it just kind of sits there stalking us, I apologize. Yeah, there is tools like that, uh, very advanced, and uh, there is another tool also very advanced in order to uh, to get the most of of a, of a collaboration by taking advanced notes and by an advanced hypertext. Uh, I could show you, for example, this one, uh, which is a, a way to to take notes about a book, Bertrand Russell. Uh, and it, it is an advanced hypertext with graphs enabled. Uh, so it will be a very interesting. Maybe uh, we are talking with Professor Joshua Pierce. Maybe uh, his book could be a good start for that. And uh, however, we are trying to to create the Green Fab Lab project as an advanced hypertext. So uh, each. Uh, approach each technology and each project could have a um, branch and more branch that could be uh, enabled with another minds another collective wisdom uh, outside uh, in the internet 
So uh, what we are trying to, to get is a uh, collective wisdom. Um, the world is better if because we have internet and uh, we have internet because uh, at some point uh, Linux enabled an open source uh, by tackling the collective intelligence worldwide. And after that, it comes Arduino, and after that, it comes Open AI, and and so on, so on. So, uh, I think that this uh, uh, could be a good start uh, for the uh, to for to continue this initiative. So, I, I I have pleasure to invite you to that, and I will send uh, mails regarding this initiative. Uh, that is all for now. Maybe Anna has one uh, has some words to say. Sure, thank you. Do you have everyone's emails first of all? Yeah, please. Could you put your uh, mails on the chat so uh, we could uh, send it send it to you uh, the news of this initiative. Excellent. And thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be on a panel with you all and um, exciting to hear what you're up to. Um, it sounds like there's a lot going on from um, turning plastic waste into protein to enabling totally distributed quality control um, and insurance distribution um, to, you know, just everything people have been working on around resilience and um, distributed sustainability building building up society rather whether it's today or um, for future uh, potential catastrophes i'm curious if uh, we could go around i think the the elephant in the room is the fact that we're all on zoom because there's a global pandemic going on and supply chains are still backed up for months um have you all learned things is there let's say something hopeful that um you're taking out of the current disruption um, that we can we can take on to our um, make sense and make resilience. Thank you, Anna. Marcin, some final words to us? Uh, final words would be, I'd like to see, I mean, definitely there's a lot of common ground in what we can collaborate on. So uh, people like Joshua Vinay or anybody else here, I mean, how do, I don't know, how do we work on selecting problems that are larger and more of us working together because the solution requires more of us wow. to do it that's the kind of logic that we have to think about but i really love to invite you to think about it on your work right now what could apply to with some of the people right now i mean i can definitely say joshua and Vinay right i mean right now uh, people are relevant to solving bigger issues how does that apply to your work so that's just a question for everybody Joshua, Professor Pierce, please. Oh, th thanks. Um, so Anna, Anna, that's a that's a great question, and I, I I'm at least I started out quite optimistic. So when the the pandemic initially hit, there was this enormous outpouring of people actually sharing open source ideas. There's pressures on companies to open source vaccines um, and ventilator designs, and you know the humanitarian engineers had like nine thousand people on a Slack channel at one point. Like it's insane. And it, some good quality open source work got developed. You know, now if you look up open source ventilator, and I did a, a literature review on it right as it, right in the beginning, and there was nothing that was truly open source and work. And now I think we've got some good, we've got a bunch of, of decent solutions depending upon, you know, what materials you have access to. Um, but the sad thing is, um, you know, there's still people working on the problems, but as soon as, you are no longer threatened the number of participants drop like a rock right back down to almost where we started <laughs> so i th i think that there's now a, an an awareness within the greater community that you know, all the stuff we've been talking about for years actually does work and if you need it it's there for you but at the same time you know this is one pandemic on one very small you know problem got a whole slew of problems that we need to be applying that same kind of energy to and so I, I think we do need to find a way to, to 
make it more mainstream, make it more traditional, like that your default setting is open source. You start with sharing and, you know, it comes from having functional business models where people can you know, pay for their kids' shoes and stuff when you need to get there. And it's at, at that on that point, especially in the hardware community, we're very early on. Um, I think technically we're more advanced already, but the how to actually make the whole system work is still challenging. And so the uh, in the end, you know, the well, especially in the U.S., the it's depressing, right? We had we had solutions, and now we're we're losing them. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. No retirement for anybody on this call just yet. <laughs> I'm working with um, some political economists who have a background in law, and it's heartening to see from you know the legal industrial scholars who have no background in open source communities starting to ask things like, um, in the U.S. we have all this government funding that goes to um, proprietary solutions which get captured by industry, and so why is it that we're using taxpayer money to really um, subsidize industrial innovation? And so there's there's a small but growing community of um, economists and legal scholars who are who are trying to push this. Uh, Great yeah. question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Muzakata really cracked that story. Yes. Bit, didn't she? Um, I met her once. She was on a panel at an event I was at, and she's about six and a half feet tall, and has the general demeanor of like Xena warrior princess or Red Sonia. She seems like you know. She should be wielding some kind of large axe or mallet or something. It is hugely intimidating. It's extremely <laughs> impressive. <laughs> I like to think that this is part of why she's been able to have so much impact. It's just people are terrified to debate her in case she gets seriously New Jersey on them. <laughs> the, the corporate lobby is strong. <laughs> we'll need some Amazons. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, I can't remember, it was some, she was debating some right winger and they were kind of rude to her and she just kind of menaced over them and they looked physically frightened. It was hysterical. <laughs> it's like, that's how you get this thing done. Um, so my take on this is that we need to move into a post-optimism perspective, right? At this point, optimism is a liability. Um, because if we're working based on optimism, I guarantee you the next 10 years are going to kill you. Right, we're we're just going to get the metric hell kicked out of us. You know, tens or hundreds of millions of people are going to wind up being completely screwed by climate change. Maybe they'll die, maybe they won't. It's going to be horrific either way. Um, and politically, you know, we're not done with this far right swing. We've got 2024 coming right around the corner. So I think we need to move into, and I really mean this, right, a post-optimism mode of engagement. Right, we're not going to win. We're not going to save the world. The world is going to smash right off the barrier, right? And if we're unlucky, it's going to go through the barrier down the cliff. But if we're lucky, it's going to careen off the barrier and then come to rest against a tree on the other side of the road. Right? But we're no longer in the domain where if we work really effectively, we can avoid the trouble. We're more in the domain where if we work really avoid work together, then you know maybe the car will be a write-off, but the passengers will walk out of it. And that kind of post-optimism approach, right, we're now negotiating with various degrees of bad, and we're going for least worst. And a least worst motivation comes from a very different place from imagining a beautiful world we're trying to get there. Uh, and the more psychologically we ad adapted we are towards least worst, the less of us will get broken by having their optimism completely betrayed by history. Um, and you know, the. Has anybody heard of this movie called The Coquettes? Heard about this? So it, it documents the passage. I'm going to send a link there. It documents the passage of San Francisco acid drag troupe in the 1960s. But one of the things that comes up in the course of the movie is a description of the economic system of San Francisco during the height of the commune movement. And it's staggering and heartbreaking. You know, it explains how the hippie economy really worked. And. You know, it's just like they built a little micro utopia basically on government welfare checks and mass collaboration. And it was super efficient for the five years that it lasted. Um, so we've come through several rounds of these cultural flowerings, the 60s, the 90s. Um, on each occasion, we learn a little bit more, but the hope that we were going to achieve systemic transformation before the world ran right into the wall 
I think we need to let that hope go. And we need to start thinking ourselves much more as like military or medical personnel where, you know, the car crash, it's like, oh, it's already happened. And now we have to start thinking about what it is for us to go in there and start mopping up. You know, and it's a different mindset. It's far more endurance based. It's far more about just put one foot in front of the other, because what the hell else are you going to do with your life? And I think that we need to cultivate this thing, which is much more military or much more medical, rather than the kind of, you know, 1950s style techno optimism, which has always run through the open source movement. It's always run through the commons movement. You know, this stuff is now a matter of least worse and it's a matter of survival. It's not about getting to the preferable future. It's about minimizing the damage we take from the, you know, awful, awful present, which is right on track for getting a lot more awful really quickly. Vinny, I wish you had led with that. We could have had a good debate this whole time. And it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? And this is not to say that it's not going to get better, but that trough that we are going into, wow, it's a bear. Under the assumption of non-collaboration throughout, which is the current case. But uh, hey, wait, do that. There's no, there is no magic collaboration theory. It's not a thing. Right. <laughs> right? In small groups, sure, that's a well proven, that's happened a lot, right? But if we keep hoping for the magic collaboration theory and what we get is people bulldozing refugee boats back into the sea, we're going to get heartbroken. And I've seen the 60s generation get heartbroken and I've seen the 90s generation get heartbroken. Heartbroken makes people ineffective and it often shortens their lifespans remarkably. Right? What I'm suggesting is that we let go of the dream that it's going to be okay, and we start getting really pragmatic, like, we are medical personnel, we are here to do the best that we can with the triage situation you've presented us with, and when our shifts are over, we will go home and we will sleep and we will be back tomorrow. You know, because doctors don't operate from hope. 100% of their patients eventually die. Right? It's a completely different mindset from the utopian visions which have motivated so many of us in this field. Right? And letting go of utopia and moving toward damage limitation, you know, it's like ending the war of drugs and moving towards the Portugal model. There is a point where we have to face reality, and reality is this is going to suck for a while, and then we will eventually sort it out, maybe. So that's my take. Post optimism. Is that a word or did you frame that? Say again? Is that is that a technical term or did you just come up with that? Post optimism, it literally just came out of my mouth. I have no idea. Thank you. Arson, you gotta you gotta save us, bring us back to at least. That's a what I'm bit saying. It's that. like, man, that shift is overnight. <laughs> oh man. Uh, maybe we'll get there within a few years. We're we're working on it. A few years. We can be the earliest if we had a major, major acceleration in our in our scalability. It's possible, it's not impossible. I I, I like there's, there's truly horrific things going on in the world, but at the same time, many of the trajectories that we're all a part of are fantastically great. So solar price declines is an example. The oh, yeah. switch over to EV cars, like we got so many things heading in the right direction. And even oh, sure. open hardware, right. the citation rate of open hardware is growing exponentially and it's 15 years behind open source software. And so if you think about open source software now, it's dominant, mm -hmm. like it's the way Every company that has anything to do with the internet is running, at least on the back end at this point, and many on the front end. And the so, I'm far, I'm far more optimistic. I think we can still get out of this. We're going to have a lot of death and unnecessary suffering, but we have always had that. And so there's no, you know, we don't have to feel particularly bad about that. We can just try to do the best that we can and, and yeah. still look at the bright side of things. Medical model, medical model. But the bright side, the bright side makes us very vulnerable to history, right? I mean, you know, I'm a product of the 1990s wave of the psychedelic revolution. And believe me, we invented plur, right? We were all bright side all the time. Um, and we've aged horribly because the enormous disappointment in the human race that comes with being an optimist basically just breaks people, right? You know, <clears throat> culturally, and I can't overstress this, our inability to look to the downside is what left us vulnerable to having, sure, open source software now runs the world's industries, but 100% of the value captured by those industries is not going back into the commons and the yeah. open source programmers are still broke unless they're working for Google. 
you know, the guys that worked for two decades on free BSD did not get paid out by Apple. And that is not a sign of victory. It's just a sign that capitalism has figured out how to capture the commons, squeeze the wealth out of it, and leave the people who actually did the work on these things broke. The only reason that Richard Solomon has a roof over his head is because somebody in San Francisco wrote him a check and, you know, the regular income stream from some guilty dot-com billionaire is why Stolman still has a place to live. <laughs> right? If we don't get much better at looking to the downsides on this stuff, we are literally going to wind up as speed bumps. <laughs> because, right? Because how much money did Apple make from free BSD? Right? Conservatively, it's probably fifty billion or hundred billion dollars. Yeah, and I don't yeah. see the free BSD guys paying off their mortgage because Apple used free BSD. That's exploitation. That's not victory. Like right? Barely baby box ex scandals. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we might be successful in being massively exploited by capitalism, but that is not the same thing as winning. And the cultural trajectory that we're on, the far right is not gone. Right? The climate stuff, you know, 50 degrees in Europe, 50 degrees in Canada, 50 degrees in Portland, 50 degrees in India. Greece burns to the ground. You know, like, it's going to be a really grim 10 years. And I think pre-adapting to that is one of the healthiest things we could do. We have to beat the rainbow unicorn stupidity out of the movement if the movement is going to be meaningful in a world that has hundreds of millions of people being displaced by climate change or tens of millions of people dying on site. But you know, the cycle. Side, <clears throat> what about the comment of okay hardware is a different phenomenon than software it can scale faster at an inflection point what about that possibility is that how does that sure. in your uh, um i mean the possibility was that the age of aquarius was going to come and lsd was going to make awaken humanity right that was the 60s version of the story. The 90s version of the story was the internet was going to awaken humanity and it was going to enable mass collaboration. Well, it did, but not for the good people, right? <clears throat> a much I don't more... know. I would, I would argue the internet's brought a lot of a lot of good. We have more it's educated both. people now. Oh, it's both. Wikipedia, with all of its faults, still is vastly superior to anything that commercially has ever been made available. The, the victory is... The victories are magnificent, but the downside is anti-mask and anti-vax propaganda has probably killed, I don't know, half a million Americans this year alone. But at the same time, I would argue that open source phenomena have saved more lives. Than them. So we still have work to do, but we're, but a lot of the trajectories are actually, you know, without being, you know, pink visioned or anything, actually pretty good. So if you compare when, when I started in solar work in grad school, the idea that we could get a PV panel a panel under three dollars a watt was just that was like the dream. And once we did that, we were all going like, to really retire. And now you can buy it for under thirty cents. Like absolutely. Then you and if you look for a deal, you can break that in half again. So it's many of the many of the areas are all headed in the right direction. We still got they're headed, stuff to get through. They're headed in the right direction, but they're thirty years too late. Thank you, Marcin. Hey, take care, Marcin. Um, okay. Um, no, I didn't, but there was an interesting convo. Um,